15 years on from the start of the Iraq war, what, if anything, has changed for the better? We talked to those who were there on the difficulties of documenting what really went on. You're watching Roundtable with me, David Foster. Stability of a sort from a dictator or chaos with a semblance of freedom. It is a terrible choice and one that the Iraqi people were unable to make for themselves. As it happened, they ended up with the chaos, a country divided and no real sign of a lasting peace. How did that happen? The Iraq war sent shockwaves through the Middle East. The dictator toppled, only to make way for a proliferation of new players in the region. Fifteen years after the US launched what it called Operation Iraqi Freedom, what lessons were learned from the war in Iraq? After two years trying to destroy al-Qaeda in Afghanistan following the 9-11 attacks, then US President George W. Bush shifted the focus of the so-called War on Terror to Iraq. In an address to the United Nations, President Bush warned that Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein was developing weapons of mass destruction, a claim echoed by the UK Prime Minister Tony Blair. Bush proposed a military operation to remove Saddam from power, and Blair promised UK support. In February of 2003, more than a million people in London and other cities turned out to protest about the proposed invasion. But in March, the first US airstrikes signaled the start of war. American forces overthrew Saddam quickly, and in 2006, he was executed. But there was no plan for what would follow regime change terrorist groups began filling a power vacuum. One of those groups was the Islamic State in Iraq, later to become ISIS. In 2009, the UK pulled its forces out of the country. And in 2011, after nearly nine years of combat, the last US troops left Iraq. Iraqis are still living with the consequences of the 2003 invasion. Having taken advantage of the civil war and its sectarian tensions, extremist groups, including Daesh, now control large parts of Iraq, while the Iraqi government struggles to maintain order. The invasion may have toppled the brutal regime of Saddam Hussein, but 13 years of war have left some Iraqis wondering if they've simply moved from authoritarian rule to chaos. Very pleased to say that joining us from New York, we have Robert Nicholsberg, photojournalist and author who reported on the invasion in 2003. Coming from New York as well, Ali Adib al Naimi, Iraqi journalist who is a news editor for the New York Times Baghdad Bureau. That was from 2004 to 2007, but was there also as a freelance in 2003. And with me at the round table, Dana Lewis, embedded reporter of 101st Airborne Division in Iraq during the invasion, and Courtney Keeley who covered the trial and death sentence of Saddam Hussein and was the Baghdad correspondent for Fox News from 2005 to 2009. What a line of introductions. All of you are intimately involved with what went on. Thanks for joining us today. Dana, let me start with you, and we'll go through where everybody was that particular night. You were waiting with the 101st Airborne. You were in Kuwait, but you knew it was going to happen. We knew probably... 48 hours to 72 hours in advance it was going to happen because those embeds uh, were unprecedented in terms of the access. So we were actually walking in and out of the talk, the tactical command center, which belonged to the 101st Airborne, and we could watch intelligence briefings unfold for weeks before the invasion. Where did they think Saddam's chemical weapons were? Where was the Republican Guard? So as a reporter, you've never, you've waited outside the doors to hear that stuff, and you've never actually seen it. So I was in the desert in Kuwait, 140,000 Americans itching to move, anxious to go, because Saddam started firing rockets into the desert. So on the night before, we had somebody throw hand grenades, a, a Muslim 
soldier in the 101st Airborne threw hand grenades into a commander's tent. Sirens started going off. Then there were air raid warnings. The Americans, by mistake, shot down a British tornado. And then rockets were being fired by Saddam as he realized that all the American forces that were coming at him were there in the desert where we were. Troops wanted to get going or they didn't want to die in Kuwait as they were getting ready to go. Ali Adib, you were in Baghdad. Uh, later on, you took up the, the posters Baghdad bureau chief for the New York Times. But that particular night, shock and awe came your way, as it was, as it was called. Did you know what was, what was coming? Oh, yeah. We were expecting that, actually. Uh, the, all the warnings from Pre President Bush at that time, uh, the speech that Colin Powell made in the, the UN, uh, we knew it was false in, in Baghdad, but uh, it was sort of uh, an expression that, you know, the U.S. is determined this time unlike what they did in 1991, which, you know, I was in Baghdad at that time, too. So uh, we were expecting something really serious to remove Saddam from power. Was it even bigger than you expected when it arrived? Yes, it was, uh, it was horrible. The, the, the noise of the bombings, the, all these uh, bombs in the first day, and the, the days later, of course. Uh, uh, I mean, it was... Uh, it was like a big operation. It sounded like something huge was going to happen. And was and, there uh, ever a moment when you thought that Saddam might survive? Um, no. I thought that they have done it in 1991. This time, no, they're not going to let him survive. OK, Rob, we'll come to you in, in a moment, if I may. But, Courtney, you were outside the country at the time. I think you were in Jerusalem. Um, but you'd covered the entire region for, for some time. Did the Middle East know how important this was going to be? I don't think at anyone, that moment. I, no, I think it. Um, it just seemed this this uh, that, that the United States was just you know, beating these drums, going into <laughs> war. Nobody knew it was going to happen. But I had been based in Beirut, and so I'd sort of studied what happened in Beirut during the civil war. And it, to me, it was past history. I was still sort of making my career, and I was on assignment in Jerusalem, uh, not going in as an embed, um, and uh, just devastated by the idea that this was going to be, uh, this was not going to be easy. It was not going to be fast. It was not as exciting as some people were watching on TV. Uh, that if, if, if anything that I'd already learned in the Middle East was that there were so many different sectarian factions, so many different things happening, and it just didn't seem like the U.S. knew what they were doing. Could you imagine thinking on that night that 15 years later, anybody can jump in on this one, 15 years later we'd still be talking about what a mess it was? I never had the imagination for what would happen then in Syria uh, with Hezbollah's rise and, and pretty much owning the Lebanese government with the stasis with the Israeli Palestinians. And if you look at the whole region and how this was a tipping point, I think we'll look back in history like we look at the 1979 revolution in Iran and say this set up a whole other uh, just geopolitical level of Russia and Iran and the U.S. playing with the Saudis and Yemen. I mean, it's just, it, it just, it just broke the region, really. So, so Robert, there, there you were. You, you were waiting to go in as well. You were with the Marines. What do you remember about that journey to Baghdad? Uh, truthfully, it, it was rather painful wearing the uh, biological gear. I mean, you, you were essentially in a sweatsuit for two to three weeks. And I was surrounded by 19-year-old Marines who had never really fired a shot in anger. So it was a little disconcerting. However, this particular Marine battalion was programmed to go far forward, the tip of the spear. <clears throat> and they, were, they, were, they acted very aggressively. The officers were part of a bigger team of Marine battalions. And it was quite interesting to watch. So you arrive in Baghdad, uh, within a few weeks there is the toppling of the statue of Saddam Hussein and, and you captured some pictures of that. Did anybody at that time think, well, pretty much jobbed up? Uh, I think it was quite a shock for everybody to see Ferdow Square implode. And since that was, a, from my understanding, a more Sunni-dominated neighborhood, there were not many people in the streets throwing rose petals at the uh, incoming soldiers and Marines. So it, it almost predetermined that this was going to be a difficult slog. But there were rose petals thrown. 
And, and if you take a look at, maybe not in Baghdad, in the Sunni areas, and I, I'm not saying this to, to celebrate the invasion in any way, but as the Americans went forward, I mean, the battle plan went upside down to some degree because they never wanted to go into An Najaf and Karbala and into the urban areas. Regime change. Go in, topple Saddam, get out. But what happened is the Fadayeen started firing on these huge lines of ammunition and fuel trucks moving forward rapidly, trying to keep up with 3rd ID, the 3rd Infantry Division, as those Abram tanks stormed towards Baghdad. And the battle plan started to turn because the Americans suddenly had to go into those areas. And those Shia areas, indeed, they were very welcome initially. And so rose petals were being, flown, were being thrown on the front of, of Humvees and flowers or tulips or whatever they had. But very quickly, people said, where's the power? Where's the electricity? Where do I get my food from? What are the Americans going to you know, get, get, get these cities operating again. And that's when the big cracks started to appear. Ali, Ali Adid, um, okay, so you came in the next year as bureau chief, but you, you lived through that time uh, in yes. Baghdad, bureau chief of the, the New York Times. Uh, how were journalists received there? Was it thought that they were documenting something that was really important, or, or were they lying, or, or how, how were they generally perceived? Um, uh, you mean American journalists and uh, those reporting for foreign outlets? Yeah, mostly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the early days, we were welcomed by Iraqis because they wanted to talk about uh, the things that they wanted to have in, in Baghdad after the invasion. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, in addition to uh, what has been said now about uh, power, uh, you know, food and work and all this stuff. Uh, you could notice also the looting of, of all the government offices and ministries in Baghdad and, uh, you know, the instability, security, people were afraid. So these were, were uh, pressing issues at that time. And they thought that if you, they talk to, let's say, the, you know, the New York Times or the Post or any American outlet, this will make them make their voice heard in the U.S. So they were welcoming at that time, but this thing, you know, gradually shifted to uh, the perception that we were, you know, gathering information. We were, uh, uh, let's say, agents for the Americans. That part of the anger against the American uh, intervention or the American invasion turned against us also. You see, I'm interested in the fact that uh, we have four journalists here, um, three of whom were embedded eventually <clears throat> or at particular times with American forces, and, and you... Ali, Ali were not. How different was your experience? Uh, well, I was with the, uh, let's say, it was at my home, and I was talking to friends and neighbors at that time. So I was uh, sort of in, in touch with how Iraqis saw what happened the day the, the statue was, uh, was uh, removed and uh, all of, the, you know, later days. Uh, Iraqis, I, I agree, a lot of Iraqis, I was one of them on the first day. I was, uh, I was happy that Saddam was gone. Uh, but at the same time, I, I saw what was happening in Baghdad, and I said to myself, why the Americans aren't doing anything to stop that? All the looting, the burning of uh, uh, government uh, buildings, uh, you, ca you could see the Americans were just watching. They weren't doing anything. Uh, and I said, this isn't a good start. It was sort of a, I was skeptical right from the beginning that they were clueless, they didn't know what to do. And then later on, Bremer came in, he had no clue what to do, and he was just, you know, uh, trial and error. Uh, so that was a shock to me. I thought they had a plan. I thought they, Iraq, as you, as you said in the beginning, 15 years later, I thought Iraq would be Dubai by then. Uh, mm. It, it turned out to be a, a huge disappointment. Daniel, come to you, because I know there's a couple of things you want to say, uh, but Courtney, let's come to you, because there was something you wrote, uh, which was how people opened up to you, because you were a woman. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this. You, this was meeting civilians and getting their stories. Yes, I mean, as a, as a foreigner, it's harder to, to, to meet people, um, to move around. And when I started going in 2005, the press was already targeted. So we had these huge security details. We lived in these sort of mini fortresses, never in the green zone. But I had all, all these people that I worked with, all these people that came to work every day, teenagers who, who worked in the kitchen and people um, that I could speak to and that were going home and telling me stories. And 
And so they became this family. We became this kind of family all living together under siege. At one point in our hotel, the Palestine Hotel, Al Qaeda tried to bring it down, kind of Oklahoma City style. Everyone survived from that, thank goodness. But that was something uh, uh, people that I worked with were, were losing loved ones in bombings. And um, I could talk to the men, uh, but I could also talk to the women. And there's much more nuanced uh, way of looking at things if you can talk to both the men and the women and also then it kind of breaks the stereotype of this idea of this conservative society where the women have no rights because that's not necessarily true and yeah. the idea of covering or not covering and all the all the different decisions and and the strength of women especially in, in such horrible times and um, talking to them talking to the guys that I worked with about their wives and how their wives were doing at home while they were protecting us and one day uh, when things were getting a little bit better for a while in 2008, one of my security guys from Iraq told me about this story about he was able to finally reunite with his best friend. He was Sunni, he was Shia, and they met at the zoo um, because it was the one place that hadn't been cleared out uh, in 05 to 09. And all the neighborhoods, you know, people were getting shot and dragged out of their homes and dragged out of checkpoints. It was just, I mean, it was, it was apocalyptic at one point. But there was this moment where they were able to reunite and he told me this story. I couldn't go to, to see them because my own security and his wife sent me a message and said, you'll never be able to tell the story of what I saw when they were reunited. So I would hear these just incredible stories. My heart was breaking all the time because I lived with everyone for so long. I mean, I would go out with the military, but I was living with Iraqis and, and watching what had been done to their country. And then the other thing is, is they were all able to get to the states on visas. And I think now, with Trump, they wouldn't be. So they've all gotten to safety and brought their families in, and, and now they're living in a place that the country is rejecting. And, and you wrote um, around about that time, I think it was, every time I go back or every time there's a bombing, every time there's a death, a little bit of my soul dies. Yeah. Um, Dana, you wanted to jump in. And then, Robert, I want to ask you about one particular story um, that you worked on. Dana, you wanted to say? Well, I mean, I guess I, I would say, in defense of the military commanders at the time, who, I mean, ran a pretty amazing operation when you think about it. Whether you're in favor of it or not, from a military perspective, they did what they were asked to do, which was go in and bring about regime change. They were not asked to go in and run cities. They were not asked to turn the power on. They were not asked to stop looting. In fact, they were told very specifically, don't get bogged down with any of that. And then suddenly there was no one to deal with because the Ba'athists all ran away. Every commander, every tank driver, the government ran away. And then the Americans in the, the civilian uh, head of the, the American administration then said, no Ba'athists, we won't talk to anyone. I mean, that would be like taking over Russia in the 70s and 80s and say, we're not going to talk to any communists. I mean, everybody was a Ba'athist who had had any influence or power. Suddenly there was nobody to talk to. There was no one to run schools. But there was, was no the one whole, to run. No plan. I mean, we can talk about the military going in and not blaming 19-year-old soldiers for going in. But why was there no plan? Well, that's, well, that's that, the American that, I have administration. To say, I think that is, to have that a plan. is for another day. Um, we're talking <laughs> about the the then, the the, the moment. And, and Robert, there was one particular story I read about that um, seemed to involve you as as the photographer, which was uh, the wounding of an American soldier, a, a sergeant. Um, and documenting his rescue by his colleagues, he later died. And it made a big impact back in the United States. <clears throat> Seemed to upset a lot of people in his hometown um, and his family. Uh, you perhaps were removed from an embed because of this, you, you'll tell me. But were you aware of the impact the stories you were sending back were having? Well, that, of course, was an extreme case. Uh, we weren't often near wounded or killed soldiers, so there was no way to predict how our stories were landing. But when I was working with the New York Times, they had a huge staff there, and therefore each day gave us a chance for a lot of uh, published real estate, a lot of ink, so to speak. There was the web also taking stories from our uh, newspaper line and expanding them into photo essays, for instance. But yes, this particular story resonated with me uh, about being removed from an embed for rather complicated reasons, but certainly ones that we were able to put back together. Does it take something like this to remind you that every story has a person behind it? 
Well, there was a bureaucracy behind it, David, <clears throat> and it really got in the way of things uh, regarding the rules and regulations and that we were to wait for 48 hours or 36 hours for the family to be notified. We waited, in fact, 96 hours, and uh, the military was embarrassed that the family had heard via the web about their son and brother that he had passed away in this uh, going from fatally wound, being wounded to mortally wounded. Uh, and this got a bit complicated with the public affairs staff of the military. In a sense, it was like going into a bank and meeting all 13 vice presidents at once and trying to do something with your account. Uh, there was a lot of anger towards us, and uh, my feeling was they felt embarrassed by yeah. what had happened. But, but interesting that the anger was not just from those Iraqis who felt that they were being uh, badly reported upon, but also perhaps back home, and it leaves you stuck in the middle. Um, Ali Adib, I want to come to you in just a moment about um, what you see for Iraq right now, because you're in the United States teaching media, but let's come to one of the most crucial uh, points in this, in, in terms of what people remember, and that was the trial of Saddam Hussein. You, you were in the courtroom when he was sentenced to death, and the image of his face and his menace, you say, will never leave you. He was terrifying. And um, as we've talked before, I've, I've, I've been up close to dictators before. Bashar al-Assad and other people, and Gaddafi, did not live up to that um, physicality of Saddam Hussein. He was unrepentant. He was menacing. He was practically snarling. I was in the, the courtroom as well. And I thought, honestly, I thought he was also detached and deranged. Deranged. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, there was something, yeah, there was something completely deranged about it, but it was, but it was scary. I remember being surprised by, you, you know, the, there was a glass between him and I. I was back with the press, but it didn't feel like enough at one point when he was walking. And I, he, he just... Plus, he would come in and first thing he would do is stare into that glass, stare at the yeah. press sort of theater. I think there were like sort four rows. Silence of the Lambs like. And he would kind of wild-eyed stare at the press and then make some statement in front of the court whenever and he, he could. And he would talk for 20 minutes or something like that sometimes. But when he actually got the, yeah. the, the, the death sentence, he turned on his heel and I had written something in the first person for the, for the Times of London and the headline was with a final snarl. He swaggered out. Like there was no, there was just not a moment mm. of, oh, they got me. Uh, <laughs> Ali Adib, um, when Saddam was executed, did the country, did you, as an Iraqi who was happy to see him, uh, his, his raid ended, were you relieved? Did you, did you think this was the start of something new and optimistic? Uh, I, was, I was relieved that an era has ended because uh, I thought that, you know, all the people who were the insurgency at that time was getting a lot of its uh, power from the the fact that he was still alive. He could go back some one day, or there could be some kind of uh, compromise. But at the same time, uh, by then, I had sort of no, not much faith in what the Americans were doing, honestly. I didn't know if they had a plan. What after the, the, the execution of Saddam? You're all journalists. There any... let, let, let me jump in, if I may, because we're, we're wrapping this up in just a moment. Mistakes made by the Americans and other sides we, we've gone into, but mistakes made by journalists, Dana. Mistakes made by journalists. Yeah, in, in believing the I think stories in the run-up to the war. Or... That's a good one, and thank you for leading me into that. But I, I think that's where you ha anybody would go, because in the end, there were journalists that I wouldn't say were complicit, but we didn't bring a, a hard enough examination of the intelligence that was being provided by the United States at that time. But the UN had a big role to play in that as well, and that they were constantly saying that they couldn't account for weapons of mass destruction. They couldn't account for sarin gas, VX gas. They couldn't account for a lot of it. Mm. So I don't know how we would have done that better, but clearly we have to do that better because even in we today's environment, yeah. there are lots well, of other so battlefields that are emerging where we better do our job Even better. more so. Um, Robert, quick one with you, and then Courtney to finish. Um, an honest account of what went on, despite all the pressures, do you believe? Uh, it was a war, really, of nuances, and it, it not so subtle ones at times, but a failure to understand the complexity of the country. Uh, a lot of journalists tried, certainly the majority did, and they were able to capture visually uh, the audio, the visual, uh, 
and in text, really, the severity and the power of, of violence in that country. Courtney? I think um, we still, it, especially for Western audience, failed to capture the humanity of, of people. It became a, a, another blanket war, terrorists, bombings, and to constantly try to, to get to the human angle, mm. which was just gut-wrenching on a daily basis, um, and sort of my calling that you there's always a failure in that because it does just become this sort of next Al-Qaeda and then it morphs into ISIS and we're still kind of failing on that level. Okay. Uh, listen, thank you all very much indeed for coming on round table 15 years ago. Hard to believe it. And we all know people who've died. You probably saw people lose their lives. Uh, in Iraq, a special mention from me from a very personal point of view that it was the 22nd of March 2003 that a fine reporter, uh, Terry Lloyd of ITN, lost his life there, the man who probably got me into television a long, long time ago. Uh, we remember all the casualties of Iraq. 15 years after the war started. From me, David Foster, and the Roundtable team, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.